<laughs> and that looks like we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Because Money Podcast. I believe this is episode 19. Thanks so much for being here. And do you know who's joining us this week? Sandy Martin in black and white. And she has survived what she is not calling a nightmare, but we are on her behalf. So uh, we're, we decided today to talk about insurance claim nightmares. So if you've got a story that's awesome, hit us on the Twitter, hashtag CMHTV, or uh, you know, if you can find a way to jump in on the Hangout, do it. If not, that's okay. But I'm going to pass it over to Rob. Rob's going to talk a little bit. I don't know what he's going to say. Uh, it's casual Tuesday. So if you're not used to the Because Money podcast on a Tuesday night, that's because we decided to switch it up because T-Ball. So Rob's going to talk about that, and then uh, we're going to talk about some nightmares, and we're going to hang it up and go home and uh, have a nice cold beverage. There you go. I'll just make, go. A cor- make a correction on the hashtag. It's uh, hashtag because money. Yeah. I'm losing my mind. I'm, it's okay. You moderate a lot. I'm getting ready for to go to an award show with CMHTV, and I just moved my column over on my Twitter so I could go with hashtag because. So you guys are so polite sitting there. Yeah, sorry. Hashtag because money, not CMHTV. And did I say? Yeah, I'm I'm done talking. <laughs> So we want to talk about insurance claims and and maybe the reason why Sandy hasn't been able to join us for for five weeks and um, I, I really just want to throw it right over to Sandy to to say hi and and we missed you and tell us about your insurance claim and and what had happened to uh, put you out of commission. Well, let me start by saying I have a really bad attitude about it. <laughs> But everything that I say is going to try and make it sound like I have a great attitude and I'm such a trooper. And Oh, it really is a first world problem. Our roof leaked. It leaked a lot because we're in Muskoka and we had quite a lot of snow and a glacier, like a minor glacier on the roof, which tore out some screws and whatever. I wasn't up there, so I wasn't really a first person witness to the, to the events. But what started as just a little drip, one kind of coming from one kitchen cabinet and then one in a totally different room, just a little drip, big deal called the insurance company and it ended up a whole wall in our bedroom which is above the kitchen, a whole wall in the kitchen, that whole side of the kitchen, all the kitchen cabinets, the kitchen sink, everything. Um, The ceiling in our living room, uh, the the wall in my daughter's room, like basically every room in our house was affected in some way. There was tarps everywhere, there was work people everywhere, I couldn't talk to clients on the phone. I mean, obviously, I was trying to keep my kids from feeling like we were refugees. We all got stomach flu, <laughs> incidental to the insurance claim. I don't think they're going to compensate us for it. But it was, um, I didn't think that it, it seemed like it was relatively minor, and it turned into a week-long stay at a hotel. And uh, Oh, yeah, and they found knob and tube wiring in the house, so that also is not at all recovered by insurance. But So for the past six, it was March 11th when all that happened, so... Yeah, almost two months. We've Only last week we got power back in the upstairs of our house. And this week is the first week we don't have people working in our house. That's my story. <laughs> and so and you only stayed you only stayed at a hotel for a week, and otherwise you've been kind of living in and around construction? Yeah. And... Yeah, dust and people in and out with dirty boots. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Trying to keep the two-year-old from, you know, picking up the hammers and hitting people with them. Yeah, so basically living through a renovation, and uh, so what What was your first step to, you know, like contacting the insurance company, and, and what, what did that procedure look like? It was just a phone call. It was just a phone call to the claims department to say, we've got water coming in, and I don't really know what the procedure is. You know, my assumption for, for something that I've, I don't like doing things that I don't know how to do, and I don't know exactly what the expectations are for both sides of the party. Um, So I assumed I would talk to them and they would say, here is step one, step two, and then this is going to happen, and then we're going to wait for this, and then this is going to happen. They sent somebody out right away, which was fantastic, and those people were great, and they they laid down, like, carpet for them to walk on, and they took care of all of our stuff, like every piece of tchotchke was a precious heirloom. Like, it was great. It gave me real hope and optimism. And then from there, it became... (laughs) kind of this black box like the adjuster came and kind of told us a little bit of information but he's done it so many times that nobody nobody gave us I call it the standard of care that's not really what it's meant to it's not really a official term but nobody said okay here's what to expect it's gonna take weeks and weeks so just right. understand don't get your hopes up you know um, 
And we had to fight to go to a hotel. And I was fighting to stay for the last couple of days. I mean, this wasn't the electrical work that was keeping us out of our house. We didn't have a kitchen sink. We didn't have a kitchen. We had tarps in every room. We didn't have power in most of our rooms. And I have, I don't want to be the, oh, I'm a mother of young children, but I'm a mother of young children. <laughs> I have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old. That makes it very difficult. to, And I run my own business out of my home. So that makes it all, that make the, it made the black box of the experience quite frustrating, I would say, to put it mildly. It wasn't a nightmare. So when you say fighting to stay for a week, is that something you're negotiating with the, with the adjuster or the claims department to say, hey, look, I need to, we need to be here, or is that something you just decide to do and then hope they might pay the bill down the road? Yeah, I don't, I don't, do, I don't do hoping down the road. <laughs> so I sent, I like things in writing. I had Brian Kelly, actually, in the Canadian Personal Finance community, I kind of just put a plea out there for information. He said, make sure you get everything in writing. That's been very, very difficult to get everything in writing. So, and nobody really explained to us who our point of contact was. So it turns out in this case, and some insurance companies are probably different, the person we spoke to was the adjuster. I found out later that there's also kind of a, a person at the head office of our insurance company who's also um, kind of where those two people work together anyway and I, you know I could have called her as well so the fighting wasn't really negotiating but it was hey this is what our life is like here we would like to I know that our policy has that coverage we've been paying for it um, we'd like to go stay in a hotel uh, I wrote that all out in an email and I get a phone call back that says yeah I guess go ahead which makes me a little bit uncomfortable right because it's just verbal <laughs> and in the last couple of days, the adjuster didn't know the company that came out to do the repairs and to start, like, the repairs aren't done. I mean, obviously, we don't have a kitchen yet, but um, kind of the uh, the rescue work, I can't remember exactly, the emergency kind of stuff to dry out the walls, the big dehumidifiers in here. and um, They didn't talk to him. That They didn't tell him that we didn't have a kitchen sink, and I didn't know that they didn't know. And so when I spoke to him, we got. We were told to get back into our house on a Wednesday, and it was the following I think Monday or Tuesday that we got a kitchen sink. And I had called him, and I was quite agitated. Let's put that. I was agitated that I was still in my house without a kitchen sink. And he said, "Well, I didn't know that. You should have called and told me." So, I think. I, I mean, I was. I already told you guys before this whole show began. This is just going to be me complaining about my first world problems. I don't even have a lesson. There's no learning you can get from me because I don't even know just, if I could say one thing. It was. It's like ask at the beginning, like. So what's who do I talk to? Who's the boss here? Oh. How long is this going to take? Yeah, I remember like when we had uh, really bad hail damage uh, last summer, and there was I think there was three separate incidents of hail, and so you know everyone in Lethbridge was getting you know letters from their insurance companies, and what they were basically saying is you know it's not an immediate concern because you know some siding rips off or whatever they'll get to it because there's so many claims, you know, but if there was something where you know your your roof is exposed, uh, shingles are busted off, whatever the case may be, you know, in the letter they say take care of any any situation that may cause future damage or damage or, or further damage, take care of that right now and don't wait for, you know, wait for your claim or your adjuster to contact you or anything. Take care of that stuff and, and then uh, we'll deal with the rest of it as it comes. So that's kind of why I asked about um, you know, begging for forgiveness rather than asking for permission, I guess. Um, you know, you need to take care of what you need to take care of to secure your home and, and, and make sure everything is good there. And yeah. so that, so we've done that, but we made a claim in uh, July or August for the, uh, we had a bunch of siding ripped off and, and damage to the roof. And it, I think the adjuster came and looked at it and it's worth, it's about $20,000 worth of damage. And that's it. I mean, we haven't heard back. We're in a queue of, hundreds of homes around here and and you know now that it's finally spring although it's snowing today again uh, <laughs> you know now that we're in uh, now that we're in spring and, and they can get to some of this roof work I imagine you know things will things will start to move but you know I imagine it'll be a year before anyone gets to work on our on our house and, and we can cover that so in your case, I mean, obviously this is just purient interest. So in your case, is it because the, the, the approved contractors are backed up or is it because the claim actually is not yet, like they won't pay it yet? No, it's the, it's the contractors themselves. So okay. basically yeah. 
we had uh, adjusters even, I think they were from Texas because the adjusters around here were so busy, not only with the hail damage, but of course with the floods around Calgary and High River in the summer. Adjusters were, you know, you could you just couldn't get one to your house. So we had a crew from Texas, I think, come and, and do the assessment and take pictures and assess the damage. And then what I what we were told to do from our insurance company was to take that to um, some contractors to get quotes. And no one would get back to us on even quotes because they were so busy. And and of course they have all like approved government or insurance related claims. So you know, they're, they're laughing, uh, and they don't really need to, you know, have good customer service skills or anything because they're, you know, they've already, their, their job quote is filled for the next year or two. And so, you know, I heard back from one guy who submitted a, a quote that was within, you know, the, the estimate. And I submitted that back to the adjuster. And I think that took till January. So, you know, almost six months. And then ever since then, I haven't heard. I followed up with the contractor to see if he's heard from the adjuster to go ahead, and I followed up with the adjuster and haven't heard anything. So I think I'm just in a long line of, you know, who's next. Yeah. Yeah, see, I'm. we just today, this morning, had a second um, contractor, approved contractor come out because uh, the thing about my area in Muskoka is that every second house has some kind of contractor in it. <laughs> Every business is a contracting business in some way. So I don't know that I don't know that um, volume is going to be or supply I guess of contractors is going to be too much of a difficulty but today they had to come because if the claim is over $25,000 they have to have a second kind of estimate sent in through their system and so March 11th May the 6th second estimate goes in. So I yeah. So knowing that it took you till January, and it was not, I mean, obviously there wasn't an actual flood event or some kind of extreme weather here, but I'm sure there was a lot of claims because that happens. So I'm girding myself to have a long wait, but when I heard you say January, I just thought, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, but, in, but, you know, to be fair, in Alberta, there, I mean, there were events that happened that, you know, un, that, that were quite unusual, so... I think that has a lot to do with it, and hmm. uh, so not only but not only did I have the home claim, but I had the, my car was out in the driveway and got pelted with hail as well. So um, that process was a little bit different. So I had sent in, uh, I called the adjuster. Uh, they had sent us. What they do is they set up um, estimate shops all over town, or they secure uh, facilities to to get all these estimates in really quickly, just because they know how many claims they'll have. And so they get cooperation from all the garages and everything around town to do these estimates. So I went in there very quickly within a couple of days and uh, did an estimate and found out it was, you know, the damage was slightly less than the book value of the car. And so what they did was they gave me an option to take, um, take a cash settlement or to fix the, fix the vehicle. And so I took the cash settlement and uh, what that meant was that I could no longer have hail coverage on that vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, right, so I'm not fixing the car, so I can't go and say, you know, next summer when it hails again, I can't go say, oh, I have hail damage again, you know, let's go through the same process. They'll say, no, you've done it already and you took the cash settlement, so as far as we know, you didn't fix the vehicle. And, you know, those dents and holes could be from... <laughs> Uh, could be from last last time. So so that's what I did, and the only reason I did it was because it was a bit of an older car, and I saw a couple of dents that I didn't really see was that big a deal. My wife might say different, but uh, um, I decided to keep the money and waive the coverage, and and now I park that car in the garage. So <laughs> that'll be my <laughs> that'll be saving me from the future. But uh, you know, right after the all those events, our home insurance came up for renewal, and I got a big letter from our uh, from our broker to say, you know, we looked at all, uh, we looked at uh, getting this done at a number of different insurance uh, companies, and you know, the, the company that we're with is still, you know, competitive and whatever. But uh, the kicker was it's up thirty percent, and um, so that that was before we had put in a claim. That's just premiums in general. And when I looked at the actual statement 
there's a clause on there that uh, is now a mandatory uh, hail coverage, and it's a $300 premium. And so that was our 30% right there. Um, so that's how they're you know, looking at these weather events, and, and you know there was three separate big hailstorms here in Lethbridge la just last year. So if they're anticipating that going forward, then um, you know they've built this into your your premiums now, so you're paying for it. And they also increase the deductible to uh, a minimum of uh, I think fifteen hundred dollars. So they've made a lot of changes, and I've seen kind of uh, some. Uh, or I've heard that, that insurance claims are, or the insurance premiums are going up. And, you know, do the insurers, I don't know, do they just use the weather events as an excuse? Or, you know, obviously they're paying out a lot of money uh, for claims, you know, specifically around Alberta. We were looking at, uh, I don't know, if it was billions of dollars in claims around the Calgary area for all the homes there. So uh, I think maybe it's a lot easier for c consumers to swallow uh, yeah, okay, I get it. There, you know, you paid out a lot of money, and now you need to recoup some of that in premiums. But you know, if it go, we go a couple of years without any kind of big disaster or weather-related event, you know, the home or the house insurance prices aren't going to come down at all <laughs> to compensate for that, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny. You had you had sent a link when we were talking about creating, like, creating this show, <laughs> like it's a great big work of art. When we were talking about this particular show that Rob Carrick video that he was um, talking about the increase in home insurance and and the fellow he had on was saying, well, you know, your house appreciates in value every year and of course, you know, you want to have that insurance coverage increase as well. I guess, I don't know, again, I keep using the phrase black box and I might not even be using it correctly, but to me it just, the whole thing, and maybe I just don't really understand the insurance business model, I just assume that they all have kind of charts of what's probable and what's not and and you know if, if things happen that are outside of like way outside of the statistical norms that they're expecting then yeah they have to do something to adjust because that's kind of their whole business model is it is probability right so right. but again it's a, it's almost a complete black box <clears throat> to me that's just me well i'm well, wondering sandy sorry rob i'm just like is ice damming covered like is be because the original, like, is the original problem vice damming covered, and then is everything else covered? Like, could you, could they have actually brought somebody out and then not covered anything? Like, or did they give you a guarantee that something, something will be covered? Did they at least explain the process to you enough so that you know what is covered, what isn't covered, and that? Or are you just kind of fingers crossed, hoping for the best? Ice damming is covered. Um, I know, okay. and kind of leaks. In the roof and all that kind of thing. Those those are covered, but I but the question that the adjuster had of our roof in particular was: Is the dam is the water coming from damage from ice, or did something else happen? Like, is it you know because that's his job, right? To make sure he actually asked us if we went up and pulled up some of the panels because that's fun. <laughs> so so I know nobody sat down and explained to me, but obviously I'm the kind of person that likes to read through things like that. So I sat down and kind of explained it to myself and then got on the phone with just the call center to ask them about my coverage. But no, the adjuster doesn't have time apparently to do that. And that's a good point because of uh, going back to the Calgary floods, they were talking about the overland flooding not being uh, covered for um, some of the homes around the river there. And that, that brought up a debate of whether or not uh, those those homes that are close to you know rivers and that sort of thing are, are you know should they be paying the piper for the for the you know really high insurance claims um, you know should they be paying a lot more insurance uh, premiums than someone that lives above sea level I guess yeah yeah it's funny because I don't remember a lot of discussion when we bought this house you know you make the phone call you're buying you're looking at the property you finally um, you know signed off on the offer and you know you're gonna get it and there's your closing dates you're calling insurance company and the information that you have is really from the owner disclosure that you get that's not something as far as I know it's not something that's kind of legally enforceable that for instance they wrote that they you know the, as far as they know there's no knob and tube wiring in the house it doesn't have anything to do with insurance but well, that's as far as I knew as well, as far as the home inspector knew and my husband knew. It all looked like there wasn't any knob and tube wiring. They said that the roof was fairly new. So we didn't go up and, I mean, the home inspector did, but as we have all kind of discovered, home inspections 
are not home inspections. They're maybe just home walkthroughs. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, home drive-bys. Oh, yeah, that's good. Looking for <laughs> the obvious thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, everything that I told the insurance company it was all by attestation. And I, I mean, I know that I believe the information that I gave them, but some of it, I didn't know the precise date of the roof. So it's funny to me that there's not, and maybe that's, it's the way that they're balancing kind of the administrative cost versus the claims cost or whatever. But to me, it's funny that there isn't a more rigorous approval process for an insurance policy to begin with. Must be like no medical exam life insurance. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, so then you sit there wondering, like, I mean, to, I don't know. My claim hasn't been approved yet. So I don't know. Is it possible that they've gone through and done all of this work in the house and then someone's going to turn around and give me an invoice for it because it wasn't actually covered. Like I didn't, I don't know. It's, again, like I said, I have no lessons for anyone. <laughs> no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and, and talk about a, a client of mine from a few years ago and he has given me permission to share the story, just not with his name attached. But I typically tell it in a, a, a scenario where I'm dealing with a client who perhaps is looking at renting out a house, you know, the kind of the, I've lived in it, now I want to move into the next house, but I want to keep this one as a rental. Yeah. Um, he ended up, that wasn't his situation, but he ended up buying a one-off rental. He wanted to get into the rental game and bought a, a house in the hood and it ended up being more of an insurance nightmare than anything. He put the money away to, to rent it out. He brought somebody in and that person, the first thing they did was call the city of Regina and had an inspector come down and inspect the house for safety. Found that the smoke detectors weren't wired in, there was not the right handles. The, the house wasn't up to rental standards. So she effectively got out of renting, paying rent for three months and then she bounced. So he then hired a rental company to manage the property for him. And they had a contract with welfare. Well, unfortunately, uh, they put in a, a single girl and the house got taken over by a gang. And I know that sounds absolutely like crazy. This is Regina, but they ended up not paying for five months. Now the rental company ended up going in and evicting her. She was kind of innocent in all of it, except, you know, she, Welfare wasn't paying the rent, so he was out basically eight months' rent. They evicted her with the rentalsman's office. I think the sheriff went down, took care of him, and basically this was a week before Christmas. So this was busting him up. He didn't like it, but then he came in from, he was an out-of-town investor. He came in, drove through the neighborhood, looked at his property, and said, why is there all the ice on the outside? Ice had collected all around his basement. He went and looked. And sure enough, after she was evicted, a pipe burst upstairs and for a week had been oh. falling down into the basement. Water waist high in the basement, pouring out the basement windows, completely cracked the foundation, $40,000 worth of damage, just initial damage, just to get the thing down. Went to put in the insurance claim. No insurance because the rental company hadn't changed it from rental insurance to the property being vacant. So because the property was vacant, they didn't honor his claim. He was completely out. And I, I usually tell that story in a don't be a landlord if you don't know what you're doing kind of context. But yep. this, the learning lesson here is make sure you stay on top of your insurance. Insurance isn't something that you just walk into your insurance broker and ask for the cheapest policy. Make sure that your policy you get matches your needs and make sure, like for me right now, I just, I'm moving and we will have a vacant house. I've already gone to my insurance office and said, I will be vacating the property here and they've got, they've given me the, you need somebody to look at it at each of these stages and I've got that down. So. If you don't take care of that, you're that's dangerous. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah that, that'll keep me out of the rental market or the, <laughs> the landlord business anyways. Um, but you bring up a really good point about the rent, renter insurance, and I don't think a lot of younger people, look, well, anyone really looks, looks at that too critically. And you think of home insurance, and you think of your own house that you own. But what about renter's insurance? And, um, you know, how critical is that for you know, all the stuff that's covered in there. Like what is, like if, I don't know, you guys are very familiar with renter's insurance, but when you, if you move into somebody's basement, say, and they're living upstairs or, or you're just living in their condo that they own, 
you know, are, is there a blanket policy that the homeowner has, and then how, how does renter's insurance kind of bridge that gap to your belongings? I am not sure of the, all the details because I was just uh, however old I was when I got married and moved out. 22 years old, I think, when I had my first apartment. And I was just like, well, obviously you get renter's insurance. I had no idea what it covered. But actually, here's my story about renter's insurance. It was so surprisingly cheap that I don't know why anybody doesn't have it. If you yeah, can get it, why don't you? It was like $19 a month or something. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, from my experience, you know, I'd have to uh, check with Scott next door. We actually do insurance here. I personally don't. But, um, you know, I know that he's said that renter's insurance is ridiculously cheap. And just like Sandy said, I mean, there's no reason not to have it. But he's even... Uh, Call it renters insurance or tenants insurance. So if you got if you're a homeowner, you've got the house, you've got your homeowners insurance, and that's a policy. But if you're renting, you should be getting tenants insurance. And if you're a condo owner, and this is something that Scott basically uh, kind of worked through with me, your yes, your condo fees cover the building, but if you're doing upgrades in your condo you should have separate tenants insurance because if the building breaks down, they're only going to break it up, bring it up to minimum standard. So if you put $40,000 worth of upgrade in your condo, you actually need your own tenant insurance policy to cover that because it doesn't go into it. So if you're a tenant, if you're renting, always have tenant insurance. And if you're in a condo project, it's worth having a look to get tenant insurance even in your own condo. Yeah, yeah that's really smart. We had a uh, kind of a, a three-month bridge from when we sold our house to when we moved into our new house and we kept our obviously kept our same insurance policy or talked to our uh, insurance company and told them we were doing that and they basically just kind of you know transferred the not transferred the policy but you know made sure that we had renters insurance for those three months until we you know got the new house insured so that worked out well for us and they were keep you know it's one less it's one thing you have to think about I guess when you're moving just like you, Jackson, you're moving. If you don't go from owning to owning, you have that bridge in between, then uh, make sure you get that covered as well. Yeah. Anything else we want to touch on here, guys? I think we talked. Don't ignore drips in your house. <laughs> yeah. It's so important, the home maintenance. And, you know, we've talked, I think we talked about it with Rob uh, Carrick on the, the, you know, the home on home, home ownership and the costs of it. And, and there's so much more that go into it. And, you know, it, it's not a responsibility that I guess comes comes lightly, and you need to you need to uh, be prepared. I guess, uh, Sandy, you're you're putting on the brave face and the uh, and saying this is just first world problems, but you know you really have to live with live through this, and for how long? Mm -hmm. And um, well, I guess if you were renting, I don't know what you'd do. You'd move. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's out. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna say hi to. I'm going to say hi to Noel. He's uh, thrown some tweets at me. Haven't been able to work them into the conversation, but Noel is a friend of the show, and thanks for that. A friend and of he's the show. A friend of the show. He's got the best title ever. Uh, renter's insurance is $19 a month. Seems kind of expensive. My condo insurance is that much. Noel, 19 bucks a month is not expensive. No, <laughs> not. Not. Not for anything. It's because I had so many valuable things. All of my piles of dragon gold, etc. <laughs> My Star Wars figurines. Gold. Wow, you really are a nerd. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. I think we're out of here. We've hit our time. Well, yeah, anyways, we're out. <laughs> Goodbye.